Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org. We're here in Barcelona. It's a great city and uh, con continuous coverage from SiliconAngle.com's uh, coverage of the HP Converged Infra Infrastructure event. I'm Dave Vellante from Wikibon, and I'm here with Dave Neal, who's with U the University of Leeds. And uh, welcome, David. Hi. Great nice to meet you. Great to have you on the Cube. And uh, we were talking off camera. You're a, you're a networking guy. That's right. And yes. uh, you were here today at the HP uh, press conference, and you were talking about uh, App DV, one of HP's uh, security products. And we're going to talk about that a little yeah. bit. But why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yeah, the university? Okay, uh, the University of Leeds. It's located in the north of England. Um, we're ranked 85th in the QS World University rankings. And we have a rather, we have a big ambition to be the world's top 50 by 2015. So we're a large university, I believe we're the second largest in the UK. We've got 32,000 students from over 130 different countries. And we have approximately 8,000 staff. So we're a pretty big organisation. And we're more or less located on, across two sites. We have a huge university campus, but we also have our network at St James's Hospital Leeds, so we also do you know, teaching in hospitals as well. Right, so, um, and how many data centres do you have? We have two data centres on campus, uh, one in our central machine room, as we call it, and one in the Holmesworth data centre. They're approximately one kilometre apart. Okay, so talk about your, your network infrastructure. Can you describe, paint a picture for us. Okay, we are... Uh, we're predominantly a Cisco network. We have the traditional model of core distribution edge. The, the core of the network comprises of approximately 15, 6,500, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, in each data center, we have what we refer to as our data center switches, which again is 6,500, so we've got firewall service modules within them, and we have our server infrastructure connecting directly to those. Uh, our edge infrastructure is the Cisco 3750s. They connect to a variety of different edge switches from 2950s to 2960s. We still predominantly offer only 10 100 megabits to the desktop because that's what most of our users require. But there are some specific applications where we do provide gigabit connectivity. The network can be split into three distinct networks. So we have our campus network with 21,000 devices. We have our halls of residence network that comprises of 7,000 bedrooms where students can connect their laptops, PCs, and these days they want to connect other devices such as Playstations and Xboxes. And then in the last year we've really expanded our wireless network. We're providing full wireless coverage in most of our buildings. So we have approximately 800 wireless access points on campus. At the border of our network, again, is an institution firewall, and that's where we also deploy our HP tipping point device as well. So let's talk about tipping point. A lot of people don't know what tipping point is. Why don't we start there? What is, what is tipping point and how do you use it? Um, tipping point is an intruder prevention system. Several years ago, uh, Prior to IPSs, there were IDSs, and that was Intruder Detection System. And the Intruder Detection System would notify you of incidents on the computer network where, they, where a machine may have been exploited, or where there's misuse of the network occurring, or where there's uh, unusual network traffic. The difference between an IDS and an IPS is that, dependent on where the Intruder Detection System is deployed on the network, that can block traffic real time. So we did it in IPS because we were seeing high use of bandwidth in the wireless network and the halls of residence network by students using peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software and we needed a solution to, to block that. So, so they were downloading music and other copyrighted material? Yes, they were downloading music, copyrighted material, software. Some of it will, will have been legitimate, right. but we came to find out that most of it was actually copyrighted material. So you, you were proactive about that. I mean, a lot of organizations that we work with say, ah, what are we supposed to do about it? But you really were very proactive about that in protecting the students and, of course, the university's reputation, right? Well, that's very important to us, you know, protecting the students. We have a duty of care to ensure that they have a good student experience. They may say it's not so good, but it's blocking the peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications. But we need to protect them. So 
if, if, when we received the cease and desist notice, you know, th this was targeted at a student, and we don't want our students to be in the trouble one day. But also, the university's reputation is very important, so we take IT security very, very seriously. And when students also visit websites to source this copyrighted material, those websites can often be infected with malware, spyware, so that there was additional benefit there in going down this road. Right, so, um, so talk about um, the before and the after. So how, what would you have to do before the tipping point software? You would, you would just get a report that would tell you this is what, what's happening and then you'd have to go, what, reconfigure stuff or was it even doable? We, we, we get a report saying at such a time, at such an IP address, it was downloading Back to the Future 2 or whatever the movie happened to be. At that point, we'd be very easily able to identify the user responsible for that activity. And we had a manual process of blocking the accounts and then speaking to the students, telling them why their account had been blocked and asking them not to do that again. But over time, the number of uh, notices increased and we found that there was a lot of staff time and effort in dealing with these copyright infringements. So we knew we had to be more clever and you know, look at maybe we can use technology to actually prevent this from happening. And, and so, um, how has it worked? It's worked really well. We, um, we were a tipping point customer since 2005, and we deployed initially the IPS just on our halls and residence and wireless networks. We chose to block BitTorrent, eDonkey, LimeWire, Nutella, probably about 30 peer-to-peer -peer applications. And since that point, we've had no copyright infringement notices. So it's been really successful. We, we anticipated uh, when we first started blocking Peter here that the students would be really upset. Be revolting. <laughs> but, um, and some of them did, but the majority, I think, had read the IT policy and knew that it was prohibited you know, to use peer to peer software in that way. We did have a few students who wanted to use applications such as World of Warcraft, which also relies on peer to peer technology. And we were able to make exceptions. So you can whitelist certain That's applications. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about this whole convergence trend. You know, we heard a lot today from HP about converged infrastructure, but just in general, the, the converging of, of storage and, and network and compute infrastructures, is that something that um, you guys are, are thinking about uh, as something you're actually doing? I wonder if from a practitioner's perspective what your angle is on that. I think we've got many opportunities to consolidate or converge some of our existing technologies. We've already made an incredible investment in our current infrastructure, so it's a matter of choosing the right time and the right product to make the move to a more converged solution. Uh, at the moment, we have separate infrastructure for the data network in terms of fibre infrastructure, and we have separate infrastructure for our SAM, for example. And I know in future there will be opportunities to consolidate that and hopefully make some cost savings. Um, with unified communications, we're where we've not really stepped, dipped our foot in the water with that one yet. We have a very traditional Siemens PADX, and we have some VoIP on campus where it's been really difficult to extend the traditional, traditional telephone cable. But we know further down the line there will be some use for unified communications, connecting into our exchange system, providing presence, but it's about getting the business case correct and infusing those with the top of the university. Sorry, Kind of an interesting dynamic, isn't it? I mean, I talked to a lot of CIOs and say, I, I don't want to keep buying in silos. We're buying silos. We have too many vendors. And at the same time, you have really good relationships with those vendors. Right? Is, is H, who's, who's your service supplier? Uh, our service supplier is, uh, I believe, a mixture of Dell and Sun. Okay, and you get network. You get networking from Cisco. From Cisco. Yep. You're getting the tipping point from HP. I don't HP. know who, where you get the storage. Uh, uh, you know, the storage I mean, is EMC. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's a whole mixed group. pad, yeah, yeah, right? So yeah. I mean. Converging that yeah. sounds good, yeah. but it's not likely to happen anytime soon, is it? It's difficult to say because with the current economic climate, you have to have a really good business case. Okay, there might be a large capital outlay now, but we've got to make sure we get that return on investment in the future. Uh, there's an opportunity at the university where we may build a third data centre and maybe 
building a third data centre with some more converged solutions. Right. But with that goes, you need to retrain, you need to re-architect some of it, and it's all achievable. But it's again, it's, for the university, it's whether we're going to get the benefit out of that. We're also considering that maybe the third data centre isn't the way forward, and maybe we should be outsourcing and using the cloud. See a lot on a lot on the table that you're considering, and you got to break some eggs too if you're going to make that. I think so. Let's talk a little bit about that the uh, the dynamic um, in networking in particular. So you, I like to say you know, Cisco sort of like the status quo, right? I mean, yeah. The big they're the big gorilla in that business, and got guys like Juniper that are that are really trying to innovate and, and scale, particularly in the cloud service provider space. And then you've got HP, who's sort of the big disruptor there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, going after Cisco hard and. Yeah. and and really trying to change the, the economics. Yeah. Um, so big disruptor, I mean, what's your take on all that? You've been in the networking business for a while, I'd love to hear your perspective. It's interesting to see, at events like this, all the different um, presentations and information and the comparisons from one vendor to another. And obviously the green issues are very relevant at the moment and HP claim they are 50% uh, more less power, sorry, less power than say Cisco equipment. Um, so I think each different vendor has their own advantages and disadvantages. You know, we have a good relationship with Cisco. We've spent a long time building that Great company, yeah, sure. And we've nurtured that to actually make our system, our network 100 percent Cisco. But maybe there are challenges there if HP are claiming that it's 50% greener and 75% of the cost and software maintenance is free, then maybe there's some attractive uh, so it makes, it, right, so this. It,